Jack Khan, thank you very much indeed, uh, not only for joining us here today, but also for the changes that you're making to this fabulous city of London. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Guy Johnson. Uh, I'm one of the Bloomberg TV anchors here based in London. I'd like to pick up on something that Mike Bloomberg just said. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So what we're going to talk about next is scaling up green investments. And that is one of the starting points that we have to work with. Uh, and um, Mike Bloomberg is working with the Governor of the Bank of England and Mary Shapiro and various others to try and provide some grounding for the conversation that we need to have when it comes to investing in green investments. Uh, and we're working on that here as well at Bloomberg. And as ever, we like to show off the functionality that we have with the Bloomberg. So I'm going to start with a function that we have on the Bloomberg, which is LEAG. And what we can see up here, hopefully, is a function that allows us to track green bonds. And as you can see, the line is moving up. But we now need to amplify that process. So let's talk about how we now do that. I'd like to welcome to the stage Helena Morrissey from LNG and David Fass from Macquarie. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about investments and how we scale them and, and where we need to start. Um, a couple of things instantly stand out this morning, one of which is political stability, which we're having to deal with a little bit in the UK today. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a moment. And the other one is, is how we measure, to, to, to Mike Bloomberg's point, the, the, the investments that are being made and how we compare and contrast and get an idea of where we're going with them. Uh, Helena, the, the, the issue of language and structure and process is really important here. How, uh, how far are we through the journey of understanding what one investment looks like versus another? And, and, and how important is it in terms of scaling these investments that we have some degree of commonality? Well, I think everyone would love to see a really standardized sort of nomenclature around the whole topic. But actually, I think partly because of where we've come from. I mean, this whole area of investment started in the 18th century with the Quakers and the Methodists and is now, you know, often uh, poured over by quant analysts in the 21st century. We're bound to talk different language and obviously religious terms and terms around mor moral issues, ethical investing, one end of the spectrum versus impact investing, positive. That's quite easy to delineate, yep. one about exclusion, one about positive impact. In between is a bit of a gray area and a lot of people have spent a lot of time around sustainability, responsible investing, trying to delineate uh, a measuring through ESG scores and other sort of methods of rating companies. But the fact is, I think we almost have to, well, we certainly mustn't use this as an excuse not to do something about it. The themes already come up today about the urgency of all of this. And a lot of people, I think, say, well, it's not really clear. I mean, pension funds, ultimately, you know, they think, well, perhaps this will detract from returns. and They don't give a clear mandate always to their investors. The reality is that we, we are on a journey where the... Um, descriptions are going to evolve as people understand more the difference between you know a financial disclosure or a risk being disclosed and the financial impact and I think it's overly prescriptive um, and unrealistic to expect that suddenly we can come up with really standard language so the important okay. thing is not to stop that from getting on with doing something about it as okay well. but it shouldn't stop us but but David Accountants have 50 different words for profit. If you take a look at a, at a balance sheet, I, there's all kinds of different evidence, all kinds of different variations upon that. And, and you have to have that standardization to be able to compare one company with another. Um, and you, you go onto the Bloomberg and you dig around and you can, you, can, you, can, you can make those comparisons. When I'm trying to invest money that I have, when you're trying to invest money that you have, you want to make sure that what you're putting that money into, trying to get a set outcome, an environmental impact, you, you're, you want to understand that that is going to happen. So as, as, as you guys invest large quantities of pension money and, and, and put it to work, how do you know that you can see the same effect with one investment versus another? Um, <clears throat> it, the, the standardization of, of all this stuff is coming together, <clears throat> and I applaud um, I applaud the rating agencies. I applaud what, what Bloomberg is doing. 
Um, we and lots of other private sector participants are trying to figure out the language for that standardization. But I think, Guy, the important thing about this when looking where to put your money or where, where we're looking to invest, the, well, the one, one of the messages I wanted to make today is there, there is no shortage of capital in the world that wants to go in this direction. And I heard a little bit about that today. I think one of the big responsibilities that corporations have, and business is a huge player in this, uh, and uh, the, the mayor, both the mayors actually mentioned a few companies that are, that are out there doing this, and I'll just pick on a few. Um, the work that we're doing with companies like um, Facebook or the work that we're doing with companies like Google or Amazon, just pick Amazon sort of as an example. We're working with them to really think about how they can use all of their distribution sites. And just to put this in scale for those of you here, um, the Amazon distribution centers around the United States of America encompass rooftops that are about the size of 2,500 Sainsbury stores. So it is massive, the opportunity that companies like Amazon have to expose themselves to the sun. Um, and, and that is happening. But I think that what, what I would like to see happen to accelerate this really is that there needs to be some stability from a government policy perspective. Yep. And there has to be a huge amount of, of pressure. And I really do think it is going to take pressure from the investors of the world to make sure that the companies that we're investing in, the governments that are operating are taking this seriously. And I do have to say, maybe this isn't the right building to say sort of a non-capitalist type of thing in. If the margins of the corporate world go down 1 or 2% over the next 20 years while we solve this problem, that's not such a bad thing in the grand scheme of life. In fact, I think it's an imperative that we, that we make those types of investments. And the money is there to do that. Helena, how important is, is the policy stability that David talks about? I, we're sitting here on a day when the UK is going through political turmoil. I sat next to somebody last night who talked me through what had happened in Spain and the issues that, that investors had faced trying to make investments there into the energy sector. Well, clearly it is important, as, as tax stability is and other policy issues, but actually this one is one that should obviously cut across party politics. Um, I think that what we need to, again, focus on is not sort of blaming one constituency or saying, well, there's nothing we can do, the important thing. Um, and actually, I do think today it's a fantastic joining together of the communities involved. I mean, it's not just finance's job and it's not just government's job and it's not just um, particular industry's job, but each of us can contribute to that. But they need to be pulling in the same direction. They do need to be pulling in the same direction. But I see, I mean, I agree with David entirely about the will there. What I think is important to concentrate on is that at the moment we have a lot of fine talk and actually even in the companies who are ostensibly very much in a signatories to fantastic things like the uh, disclosures on climate uh, related risks um, aren't necessarily living and breathing what they're talking about and actually we've got we need to create this real joined up chain um, but at the moment there are lots of gaps in the chain and lots of weak links um, as well. So, for example, and this is going to sound a bit sort of self-promotional, it's not meant to be, but last year, um, when you look at the climate-related resolutions um, from the US companies published so positive support for climate change, um, when you look at the world's top 10 largest asset managers, uh, on average, only 21% was supportive in their votes. Now, we voted 95% supportive, and we were a long way ahead of the next one. Now, I don't say that sort of, you know, try to puff us up, but it's more we need the others to be there, too. Sure. It's no good saying, actually, we're really supportive of this. We actually need to do it and not just talk about do it. Do you think they're worried, just dwelling on that for a moment, do you think they're worried about the 2% kind of margin hit that David's talking about? Do you th is that the concern? Well, or is it go beyond that? Well, I think a lot of it does come back to there is this, again, a bit of an excuse often that actually there may be a diminution to returns because you're doing something that is good for the longer term. Yep. Um, I think the evidence is mounting, certainly over the last three to five years, sort of companies that have scored highly on ESG-related issues, whatever the dimension you look at, have tended to outperform others. And I think we've also seen obvious risks, um, like you know, Volkswagen being the obvious one, uh, where an issue has really detracted from shareholder value. So I think we've kind of, again, slow. We're too slow to react. We're too slow to be proactive. Um, and I, I think you know, enough's enough. Enough's enough. <laughs> <It's only something laughs> Money makes it. the world go round, so we should be using it, you know? Yeah, and amplifying <laughs> it and putting it together and yeah. making sure that it, it kind of, it, it, it pulls in the same direction. Talking of pulling in the same direction, David, I, one thing we are learning is that if, if, if public opinion moves in a given direction, the effect of that can be quite dramatic. And, and I only sort of see what's happening around me here in the UK. Mm -hmm. the, the impact that David Attenborough had in terms of the debate around plastic has been absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, <clears throat> how do we create a similar story in finance that, that, that changes hearts and minds in a way that, that we haven't seen before? I, that, that happened overnight. And we all, to a certain extent, have a degree of control over the way that our money is invested. Mm -hmm. How do, we, how do we make that work in this particular sort of channel? I think I, the, the, the hearts and minds argument of the common man and woman on the street, I think, is one thing. And, and people like yep. David Attenborough and forums and exchanges like this are another, you know, another way to amplify the message. My feeling is that what the, <clears throat> the financial services business needs to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to be working with the real innovative companies of today and frankly of tomorrow. And, and there, I don't think there should be any mistake about this. There, there are some very forward thinking energy producers that are out there. Some of the best ideas that sort of come into the world of renewable energy come from BP or come from Chevron. In, in fact, I think they're, they're world leading. Some of those companies that we think of as old school yep. are, are actually really innovative. So what I think from, a, from an allocation of capital perspective, I think there really needs to be an onus put on, on us, the financial intermediaries of the world to let that capital flow to the people who are the most innovative in doing something with that capital. And we are finding um, aluminum producers sort of around the world. We're finding cities like in Dublin that don't want to have landfill, don't want to waste their space with landfills, don't want to dig up any coal, are really beginning to think about how they can use what used to be the dirty word of incinerators or some type of waste energy projects to, to actually be able to power the city of Dublin, avoid landfills, and avoid using coal on the entire island of Ireland. There are companies that are out there doing those types of things, and I think we as financial intermediaries have to look for the people that are real the leaders of tomorrow, because it is possible. Yeah, so we did a survey. Um, we have a campaign called Own Your World, which is actually our flagship sort of picture for it is um, the ocean and a, a beautiful sort of spotlight on what we'd like to see. It's surrounded by plastic, but then fish swimming in it. And we asked, um, we did a survey of adults uh, aged between 18 and 55 in this country. What was encouraging was 90% plus said that they really felt uh, strongly about uh, minimizing their impact on the environment. But a lot of them weren't sure what to do about it. Um, they were, as you would expect from the David Attenborough work and so forth, very focused on plastics. Um, but also, they wanted other sort of tangible things, so food waste, um, things that really, and I know we've got lots of more fascinating discussions than ours on sustainable fashion in a minute. Um, but you know, that things that actually yep. were tangible and meaningful. And I think it's, it is, uh, again, joining up the, yes, it's important that we engage with the top, you know, we have actually good conversations with all of the, we identified 84 companies in the world that we felt could make the biggest impact on what happens next on the climate and engage very robustly with them, and they with us mostly. But at the same time, try to create a real groundswell of public opinion around this that would really, I think, accelerate um, what financiers do about it. Because it is this push-pull at the moment, and um, everybody's sort of vaguely joined up, but as I said earlier, not quite pulling in one direction fast. <clears throat> but, Guy, I would say one thing, and again, I'm, I'm really grateful and, th and uh, thank you to those of you that, that put this event on today. The, the, the time is right to have this conversation. The, this message about whether it was Attenborough's event uh, or, or the documentary that sort of just came out two days ago, I think the pile of money that's out there in the world in this low interest rate environment is whether that's pension funds or insurance companies or money managers or asset managers of all sorts, this message of sustainability being important the message that the young kids delivered sort of on the screen, that, that's, I feel like that job is, I won't let's call it not job done, but that, that awareness is right. there. And, and I, I, I really do believe that, um, that, that the capital allocators of the world need to be looking for sort of where the, uh, where, where the real well, people are going to make Why is there a, a gap between the two? Why, I, so the groundswell is that, that sort of job is done. The, the public perception is, is moving in the right direction. What, is it, what will it take for allocators of capital to extend that process. You, you talked about one of them earlier, and uh, I feel there's uh, some politicians sort of in the room today. The, the stability of what the regulatory backdrop of right. all this type of stuff is obviously very important. Yes, Spain went through a little bit of a wobble. I spent some time in Greece last week. They went through a little bit of a wobble of redoing feed-in tariffs. It, it's very normal, I think, as this was not a discussion 10 years ago. Uh, and it's, I think it's very normal for governments to go through periods of, of trying to learn how to do this and how to make sure that that capital flows. And I think that we should try to be, that we as investors, we need to be, keep, keep making that message clear that these, when, when we make these types of investments times tens of billions of pounds, this stuff is going to be in the ground, uh, whether it's solar or wind or biomass, is going to be in the ground for 50 years. And therefore, yep. we need a very, very long-term view of this. And I think that's missing. Just very briefly, um, what can we do, David, in terms of ensuring that the lessons we learn now don't need to be relearned elsewhere in the world? 
Um, I give a lot of credit to what's gone on sort of here. The UK has really been a leader and an innovator of the way to write government policy and to allow entrepreneurs to develop new types of things. Um, we had some discussions last night at dinner. I think the real thing that, that we can do here from the UK and from the US is to get this message down into some of the very, very rapidly growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia and see if we can't leapfrog the whole process of, of powering those economies as they come online over the next 50 years, not to go through the let's start with coal, then go to diesel, then go to natural gas, and then go to solar, wind, and biomass. I think that what we can do here to make this make a real difference to climate change is to make sure that we leapfrog a few of those steps in the developing world. We will leave it there. Ladies and gentlemen, Helena Morrissey, thank David Fass, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Uh, as Helena hinted at, we are going to be uh, continuing the conversation, so I'd now like to welcome uh, to the stage Christian Amapur and Stella McCartney. Thank you.